Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Uli, uh, and today we're going to talk about three ways we can gradually adopt GraphQL uh, without writing any backend code. Um, the reasons that I think it's important is because in many of the cases when people want to use GraphQL is in an existing environment or in a large uh, company. And there's always, um, in those environments, it's always much harder uh, to introduce new things. Like you need to convince people and adding the burden of adding a new server or new architecture to your data center is never an easy thing to do. It, it might take time. So in our day-to-day -day in the company that I, I started, uh, we help large companies do those digital transformations. And we came up with kind of like a master plan that works for us on how we can gradually adopt GraphQL and make it happen even in organizations that usually it's very hard to introduce those changes in. Um, so today I want to share with you kind of like our master plan and maybe it can work for you when you want to introduce those technologies into your uh, company or stack. Uh, so a bit about us, uh, the, we call ourselves the Guild. Uh, we are a group of open source developers. Uh, we mainly build libraries around GraphQL. So we have a lot of famous libraries in the ecosystem, like uh, GraphQL Code Generator, uh, GraphQL Inspector, GraphQL Modules, uh, and many others. We're probably the largest open source group in the GraphQL ecosystem. Um, and the reason we build all those tools um, is basically because you can take all those tools and integrate them into a full platform, but we think that we wanted to create those tools so you can gradually adopt them where it's, you see fit and it can help you every step of the way because, like I said, in most cases, in what most of the companies we work with, you can't just remove everything. You have a lot of existing infrastructure that works and you want to gradually adopt the parts that you want where you see fit. Um, so that's a bit about us. Now, back to the subject, uh, let's give a bit of an overview about GraphQL. So GraphQL is a, is a powerful query language over a schema. And the schema can basically describe uh, data sources, any data source. So the schema can describe data coming from a database, data coming from uh, the network, from different services, and even from a local file system. But once we describe that data and how to fetch it, uh, we can query that uh, data sources. And when we can we query them, we get predictable results with just the things that we need uh, in the shape that we need them to be. Let's see an example. So if we'll describe a schema of a user and a message, we can basically introduce a new GraphQL engine between our clients and our data sources. And now if our client is asking, for example, for a user with ID 2 and the user's name, uh, the client will send one uh, request to the GraphQL engine. The GraphQL engine will fetch the user, extract the user's name, and then send back one result uh, and one response with the, exactly the result that the client expected it to be. Um, and if now we would want the user's name and messages, again, the client will send one single request. Uh, the GraphQL engine will get the user, then in parallel will get the user's name and messages. Uh, and then maybe the content will actually come from a third-party API or a WordPress or something like that. Uh, at the end of the day, the client doesn't care. The client will get exactly what they asked for in one response. Um, basically abstracting away all the things that the client shouldn't know about how the data was fetched and all the orchestration part and things like that. So that's very powerful. And when people talk about GraphQL, the main benefits that they uh, mention are performance benefits, less data over the network and less requests over the network. And that's true. But I think if we look a bit about how GraphQL works, we can see more benefits than, in my opinion, are actually more important than the performance benefits. So when we describe the data and the schema, we basically also describe in small boxes or 
basically functions that in GraphQL uh, they're called resolvers, um, how to fetch each field. For example, this box called user's name uh, gets, we know that it's going to get a user, and then it's going to do some work, maybe call a data source or something like that, and it has to return a string that represents the user's name. So we just need to write those functions, um, and we can also like separate those functions between um, between the right team members, and it's very easy to um, uh, create tasks related to those. But then what GraphQL would do for us, and everything in that slide is something that GraphQL does automatically for us, GraphQL will receive a query, and then just by that query, GraphQL will run and execute the first resolver, get back the response, and then we'll bring on the boxes that we created before, we'll send them the uh, user's object and run them in parallel, we'll put the first result in the, in the query, but then from messages we're going to get three messages. So GraphQL will automatically execute for each message uh, the date and the title resolvers in parallel, and we'll put the result in the right place, and will give us the the, res the expected result. Everything here is happening automatically. So when we talk about like um, uh, where do we want to adopt GraphQL, I think what we need to ask ourselves is that work that I showed you, um, where do we do that logic today? Where would we send all those requests and responses and wait for them to come up and then or like manage the data or um, and, and get back the result that we want. I think that if we look at traditional um, applications, that work is usually happening on the client. So the client sends a, re a REST request to the server, um, gets all the data that it needs, and then waits for all the responses to come back and then basically assemble those requests on the client. Um, but they do it manually, in code, usually. So maybe, you know, if we want to start getting the benefits of GraphQL, we should maybe just take GraphQL and use it on the client where we write that code manually today and just exchange the code that we anyway write today manually um, to be automatic and use GraphQL as a function on the client. And that's the first... Uh, step that I, uh, or the first way that I want to introduce or how to introduce GraphQL, if we are able to run or to create our GraphQL server um, in JavaScript, we can just take GraphQL GS, the, the regular GraphQL uh, um, reference implementation library, and because it's JavaScript, we can, the same code that we can see running on the server, we can actually just start using it on the client. Um, and get all the benefits from the client. So we can start now writing queries from components um, and, let, um, and let GraphQL manage all the interactions with our servers. Um, so that means that on our components, this is an example Angular component, but it's the same for React or Vue or, or native applications, we can start basically, instead of writing a lot of difficult code of understanding in services what requests we want to do for the server and stuff like that, we can just write simple queries next to each of our components. And when we want to do changes and we change the component, all we need to do is to change the query in one file right next to the component. And that's it. GraphQL will help us fetch that data automatically. Um, so just by doing that, um, and just by doing that on the client, we basically took that work that GraphQL is automating for us, and we were able to remove a lot of the code that we would do otherwise. Um, and, you know, you can ask yourself, well, is that really beneficial for me? Like, did I actually get a lot of benefits from it? Like, because I didn't send less requests over the network, so the magic of GraphQL performance didn't happen. But... I would say that this is actually the biggest benefit of GraphQL. Like, let, I just quote here from a PayPal blog post that was out, I think, over over two years ago. And let me know if you this quote uh, is something that 
you can relate to. They said, we found that UI developers were spending less than a third of their time actually building UI. The rest of that time was spent figuring out where and how to fetch data, filtering and mapping over that data, and orchestrating many API calls. Now building UI is a nice to have or, or an afterthought. And I must say that almost every uh, UI or product uh, team that uh, we work with feels the same. So basically two thirds sometimes of the work that they were doing, GraphQL was making two thirds of their work much easier and much more automated. And I think that's a huge benefit. So even though um, you know, we didn't get all the performance benefits from the network, we're already making change. Um, we already introduced, we're able to introduce GraphQL uh, and the best thing is that we just install it as another NPM library on the front end. We didn't need any crazy approvals from architects or from managers or anything like that. It's just like we added Redux, we added GraphQL, but we were still able to make, I would say, very significant change of how we write our applications. Now, it's also not completely true that we can't start optimizing the network. A lot of the um, interesting um, tools that comes with GraphQL over um, improvements of how you uh, access the data, for example, data loader, which I won't talk too much about it here, we can already introduce those techniques even if we just use GraphQL on the front end. So it's not only that we automated some stuff, we also can introduce additional tools from the GraphQL ecosystem to start also improve performance um, uh, on the front end, even though we didn't do anything on the back end. But let's say this is ready. One of the most powerful te things in that technique is that let's say we started working on it and everything is fine and we use GraphQL GS. At any point in time, we can now take basically the same code and move it to the server. And then we will also get the benefits of more having a network network that is more performant. So we can start on the client, but we can start introducing this thing into the into the company and slowly move into the backend when we're ready. And in many companies, we never get to that step and people are still very happy because the front end developers got to use GraphQL and got to use the ecosystem and become more productive already. So that's the first way of going about it. Um, and the powerful thing is like, if you're starting in that way, you, it's like you're the same developer whether this GraphQL server was running on your front end or on your back end. Um, so it's just about the concept and less about where it runs. And also a lot of, um, I would say, common questions when people are introduced to GraphQL, like how does our, uh, GraphQL end, handles authorization and authentication? and who is responsible for the schema, to create the schema, it's not a question anymore because we never th thought to do the um, authorization part of GraphQL when it was on the client. So we moved it to the server, nothing changes. It's the same answer. Same thing for, for the schema. On the client, we created the best schema that the product needed. So when we move to the server, that still should be the, the, the same answer. So the thing is, when let's say we're still using it on the client and our applications are getting more and more complex and we're adding more and more features, um, handling all those, uh, what usually is happening is people start to introduce a GraphQL clients like Apollo and Relay, which is basically um, a po powerful clients that understand GraphQL. They have their own store and they give you all kinds of um, powerful tools to handle front-end uh, data management with GraphQL. The thing is, is that those clients are usually kind of their own GraphQL engines. So if we look at Apollo, for example, Apollo has its own kind of front-end ecosystem. Um, so here I'm going to talk about the second technique that you can use in order to start introducing GraphQL um, without affecting your backend. So Apollo is a GraphQL um, client, but it also has this type of architecture where 
Apollo can query GraphQL over the network, but it, it can also query from a local data store or from a REST data store. So it's kind of like it has its own small GraphQL engine in a way. And it has this architecture that's called Apollo Links. So it's kind of like network layers, network links that are followed each other. So one of those links is called Apollo Link REST. So basically that means that when Apollo queries something, it will go through the link architecture. And when it gets to the REST link, if the query is marked in a certain way, instead of sending a GraphQL request, it will send an HD, a regular REST request. Let's see it here. So if you see on the top, we, have, we want to query the status, but we put the REST annotation over that query and we tell it what's the path. And Apollo link REST will automatically send uh, the, the REST request that we want will take that result and put it in the Apollo store. So this is the second way that we can start introducing, um, or the second technique that can help us to start introducing um, REST into, uh, uh, sorry, GraphQL into our front end. Um, we can just use Apollo link REST. And uh, this technique can be very valuable in the future as well, because later on you can start from REST, but then Using the same client, you can basically do some queries that follow REST, some queries that go to a GraphQL server, and some queries and data types that goes to your local um, data store, like your Redux store or whatever. So it's a very, it's, the second technique is also a very powerful um, way of doing it. Um, so now let's talk about the third way of doing it. So you know, let's say we have now uh, a client and what we have uh, today is that we call existing servers like um, REST server suite Swagger or gRPC um, or maybe SOAP services even. So those servers already have some schema or some data and we're already calling them without even using GraphQL. So what we thought was like, can we take those informations that we have on those servers, let's say create a schema for them, and then from those schemas, let's say if it's an open uh, API or Swagger schema or gRPC, maybe we can automatically convert those into GraphQL, and then even merge all those sources into one GraphQL, uh, one GraphQL schema and service. Um, so basically, even though our servers are not GraphQL, we can automatically query them as if they were GraphQL, but over the network, we will still send REST requests. So that's a new library that we released that's called GraphQL Mesh. So GraphQL Mesh basically can take any source, convert it into GraphQL, and basically let you query that source as if it was GraphQL without affecting the source at all. Um, so it's an extremely powerful library, but I think one of the most powerful things about it, most people talk about that library on the backend context, but the important thing to understand about that library is that it can run anywhere. So we can do the same, we can just create our new mesh SDK and just use it on the client. And when we're ready, we can move it to the server. Um, so here is like a very short example uh, we are querying two APIs here, cities and weather, that are Swagger APIs we have no control of. By just, by just defining those sources in uh, our mesh config, you can see here that I'm querying those sources as if they were GraphQL. Uh, and I can use this thing on my client. So here I got a GraphQL query that I get exactly what I want. But more than that, I can even link those sources. I can link those two APIs, and I can add between uh, cities, I can add, the, let's say, a daily forecast on a city. And just by writing a couple of lines on config and a couple of lines of code, now what I can do is I can go back and I can query um, those sources as if they were one source connected, one graph, and I can query the daily forecast for Tel Aviv 
which is extremely powerful, mostly because those backends have no idea that I'm doing it. I can run this SDK on my client and get all the benefits that I need. So that's the third um, option for you to start using GraphQL without doing anything on the backend. Um, and it's a very powerful library because we can have, and we already today have handlers for all kinds of sources. Um, so um, whatever sources you're using today, you can start generating SDKs and you can start using those on your client. Um, there's also, it gives you a lot of, of course, customizations that you need uh, uh, and things like that. So in summary, I think GraphQL is an extremely powerful uh, technology that lets you move fast. Um, and it's also very much fronted oriented. So I think before you can start using it today on your front end and then slowly and gradually get understand the benefits, see them in action, remove existing code that you write manually today and automate it, and then slowly, slowly introduce the same concepts into your deeper and deeper into your stack. And even take the same code, if you're using JavaScript, you can even take the same code and just gradually move it to the backend um, if you want. So I hope that was helpful. Um, and if you want to ask more questions, you can reach me uh, in my GitHub and my email is public there. And I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, thank you very much for listening.